This is West Coast Sasquatch Research. Good morning, dear listener, and welcome to episode five of West Coast Sasquatch Research. I want to start out by thanking you very patient people with uh, my efforts of doing a podcast here. Uh, It's still a learning process for me, so uh, kindly bear with me for any uh, gaffes or faux pas that I might commit uh, while I try to entertain and inform you. And uh, by that uh, regard... I think I've got an interesting show for you today. Um, About a couple of decades ago, I uh, went over to John Green's house and uh, I spoke to him about uh, doing a casual conversation type recording for the uh, BigfootForums.com, of which uh, we were all members of at one time or another. And uh, so he said, sure, no problem, come on over. I phoned him that night and said, I'll be over the next day kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that was the thing about John Green. He would always put time aside for a researcher who wanted to come and discuss things with him uh, in his own home. He uh, always made people uh, very welcome, and his door was always open to people. So, I, you know... I got to hand it to John Green for that. Uh, He was uh, quite a gentleman. And uh, anyway, I went over to his house. He was just finishing breakfast, and we sat down and started a conversation. And uh, I whipped my recorder out eventually, remembering it, and uh, plunked it on the table between us. And uh, we just happened to be at the time talking about uh, the indigenous people and their beliefs in Sasquatch and what it's all about and how come their belief cannot coincide with our belief. And uh, that's where the conversation was at, at the point where we pick it up. So uh, I hope you enjoy. And uh, without any further ado, I'll give you the green man himself. I'm I'm not any kind of an expert on Indian information. Uh, the uh, the culture that we live in is almost unique in making this clear distinction between real and unreal, and we have to assign everything to one side or the other. Mm-hmm. Most cultures have not and do not, including the culture of the Indians. And North America. So, uh, so you are you you're referring to how, how important myths are? Well, no, you, you can't. My whole career in this is trying to establish where this fits on this in this reality question. It's a question that in the Indian culture isn't even asked. So information from within that culture doesn't work on this question. Mm-hmm. Okay. Can you tell me now, when you first came to Harrison, mm-hmm. uh, you ran a newspaper here in Harrison, correct? Well, in Agassiz. In Agassiz, right, I'm sorry. And uh, J.W. Burns, and uh, he was... He was no longer here. I never met him. You never met him. But uh, you knew of the stories that he had. I grew up yes. in Vancouver, where the, the stories were familiar. You know. Right. And uh, so you were pretty much a skeptic back in those days about this, as you just explained. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so what happened? What, what, what made you a believer? <laughs> uh, well, for one thing, uh, the word believer isn't appropriate. Mm-hmm. So we use it all the time, but it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, 
but I encountered the fact that there was what in any other context would be taken as solid evidence that there was something to this. Was this back, uh, with those uh, set of tracks were found in Eureka? No, it was crew. before that. Before that? Yeah. Devin, uh, Harrison got a lot of publicity proposing to have a Sasquatch hunt mm -hmm. during the BC Centennial mm -hmm. celebration. And uh, a fellow who worked for me uh, was talking to the custodian at the high school. Uh, this subject had been, you know, become a topic of conversation. And uh, this man had seen the tracks at Ruby back in 1941. And I already knew him and knew that he was a respected, well-respected person. I went and talked to him. He described the tracks, even drew a, uh, an outline of them, how he recalled them. But unfortunately, there were no cast made. There was a cast. There was? Oh, there by was. The, by, by this, it no longer existed. Ah. It had been made by a deputy sheriff uh, who had come up from Bellingham, a man who been investigating this, and I don't know that much about it. Uh, one of his children did tell us that he had a whole room full of material and died. So he obviously was seriously investigating. And um, uh, one of the family gave me a tracing of this cast that uh, matched, you know, superficially. I, the drawing that I had been, been made, oh, the man's name was Essa Tiffany. The drawing that Essa had made a, was actually the floor of a, a garage that he was building. And so, of course, have it. But, but uh, it appeared very similar to the thing that I received a few months later. And the other thing is the. Uh, the local game guide was Jack Kirkman, his wife Martha, cousin of the uh, Mrs. George Chapman, who'd seen the creature at Creek. And they were friends of ours, so talked about it with them. And she said that the experience had pretty well ruined her cousin's life. That really? She'd become an alcoholic and something she couldn't get over. And then I talked later on to Mr. and Mrs. Chapman, but I, of course I, I hadn't known them previously. It was the association with these two people that I did know. And of course in the newspaper business, uh, getting information from people and deciding whether it's accurate is a part of the job. Mm -hmm. And these people seemed entirely credible. Well, and of course, when you, uh, with regard to the, uh, the footprints, we then contacted other people who'd seen them. Right. And, uh, you know, the footprints required an explanation. And then there were uh, other accounts that came out because the Vancouver newspapers made a really big thing out of this Sasquatch hunt. They literally had Sasquatch included in their front page index quite a few weeks. And they were generating stories. Pieces. Right. Yeah. yeah. And one of those was a fellow from Vernon who had a sighting between here, uh, up near Flood between Chilliwack and Holt. In 1955, that was mm -hmm. only two years before the time we were talking about. Right. And uh, another was a very detailed description by a fellow up at Tijash and then William Rowe, uh, whom I later was uh, in contact with some zoologist about buffalo, uh, was considered to be a, a, a very reliable and mm -hmm. informed source 
as they were concerned. I never met Roe. He, he moved. He was in, living in Cloverdale at the time the story came out, mm -hmm. but he was in Edmonton very shortly afterwards. But he did send me a written account of what he'd right. seen, and he had it. Uh, went to the city hall and had, had it attested to. Uh, it. Is, isn't that not the same thing with Osman? Uh, with uh, that took the right. local magistrate to see Osman. Yes, that was that was your idea to have an affidavit. No, I, I, at that time I thought that this would have some effect in making these be taken more seriously. Right. It turned out that that was not the case, so I didn't bother doing it anymore. Uh, yeah. Well, um, speaking of Foots, okay, we all know that's the main source of evidence of the Sasquatch around it, except for the Skookum cast, but... Well, I, I like to look at it from the opposite end. The footprint are real, uh -huh. indisputably real. Mm -hmm. They require an explanation. As the Hinden said, something's making some goddamn footprints. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that is getting awfully close to 50 years ago. It is indeed. And no explanation for those footprints other than the existence of an animal with feet like that and sufficient weight has, has been presented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many casts do you personally own this? Uh, maybe about 10 or 12. And which is the most impressive one in your mind? Probably the uh, uh, unusual one from uh, the cast that Bob Titmus made at the film site. Uh -huh. What is a, a real break in the middle of it. And for years, it was assumed that it had stepped on a stick. Right. But when uh, Jeff Melton was studying casts, pointed out very quickly that the, there is a twig of sticking out of the ground right beside it. Pointed out that this had nothing with it. The, this uh, imprint was made by a foot that bends in a way that human feet don't. So this was the break. Yeah, the mid-tarsal uh, break. Yeah. Wow. No, uh, oh, I just have a plastic copy of that uh, one. Yeah. But I, I think that is the most impressive footprint now that uh, this information has come out. It, your database. Yeah. Everybody wants to know about your database. Now, would you would you consider yours to be the largest? Oh, no, the, the BFRO now has a, a larger one that's growing. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And on the other hand, there are so many reports now that I'm not on it. I well, I think with the advent of the Internet, ports are just, I imagine, flooding in pretty fast. I would say that at least a half a dozen a day on the one site. Yeah. Oh, but, but with the database, so there's one other thing to say. That you can't access the BFO base. If you want to know how many prints were 16 inches long, you have to go through the whole 8,000 or whatever yes, report. no cross-reference. Yeah. Yes. Of course, mine's cross-reference. You, finally, you finally got that done. I remember reading a couple of years ago in an interview you did that you were working on a cross-reference database. Yes, well, it was always reference, but it yes. was a matter of getting all the material. You were, yes, it. constructing it, yeah. And and I, I have to myself. I can't just hire somebody and say, you do it. There's, there's too much double-checking and weighing to be... So the answer to, to the question about the database, yes, it exists, and yes, you are the one in charge of it. Because people are wondering whether or not you have somebody else taking care of the database for no. you, or... The problem now is that it's, it's on antique software. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people, the software won't even run properly on uh, anything beyond Windows 9. Oh, I see. Well, it'll run, but uh, it, uh, 
presume this could be corrected, but it only uses half the screen on it when you use them at Windows XP. Oh. And this, you know, you, you can see a great deal less. You just got a strip instead of. Yeah, right. So that's not handy at all. So it's this is this a DOS? Yeah, a DOS program. Yeah. 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 Now it can be converted, but this is not easy either. To a uh, Windows application? Well, I haven't done it, but uh, uh, Richard Greenwell and a professor down in Tucson have, are working with it on some other computer setup. The technology is not keeping up. Well, no, well, I'm not what keeping up. <laughs> Uh, okay, based on the reports that you've amassed over the years, I just wanted to do some stating here. Why do you think, I have my own opinions, but no one's interested in my opinion, they'd rather hear yours. Why do you think that Sasquatch scares the heck out of us so much? If I saw a gorilla in a field, I would say, hmm, that's interesting. There's a gorilla in the field. If I saw Sasquatch in the field, I'd probably buy pants and keep running till I hit something hard. Well, it, it may be just because I'm familiar. I, I don't think that would be my reaction. Well, yeah, different people do have different reactions. Sure, there's reports where people do not seem to have any fear at all during their encounter. Well, I'm, I'm afraid of yours, but if yeah. I saw uh, one, I would yeah. probably just tend to watch it. But in, in the reports, you get people who say that first the smell, and then this feeling of panic, this feeling of fear. There could be a, a, a inherited genetic react to something that they are able to do. I don't know way beyond my expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, well, we're just speculating here yeah. anyway, you know. It's, uh, but, but that's something that's always fun to talking, you know. Reading. Excuse me. I'm sorry, excuse me. <laughs> They're talking now about the, the possibility that uh, they communicate in ultrasound. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That was, uh, yeah, that, that, might, that might do it, if that, if, if that is the should turn out to be the case. Yeah, and, and by the saying, okay, the uh, emitting, or what about the intake? They, 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 the submit reports feel that it's possible that this journal, I don't, I don't know, and uh, maybe it can detect infrared light emissions on camera traps and what have you. Yeah, that's another possibility. Uh, yeah, hence another reason why there's so few, if none, good pictures of Sasquatch. <laughs> so far, I, I'm not aware of any camera trap picture. No, no, and uh, it's pretty well it's pretty well uh, taken for granted because of people who have reported an encounter with the creature, using their flashlight and getting their glare from the eyes with the rods that a lot of animals have for night feet that the humans don't have, which causes this red reflection in the eyes. I as well uh, speculated that these creatures have excellent night vision, like a cat. Well, they, or they're no, certainly any nocturnal hunt. They certainly have some good degree of night vision because they're so active at night. Yeah, the uh, the eye thing is a problem because a lot of the reports the eyes glow in the yes. daylight. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when, when you have, in my case, database, almost the same number of reports at night as in the daytime. Yes. When you consider good. all of the handicaps of the potential observers at night. It seems to me solid evidence that they're far more active at night than in the daytime. Right. 
Isn't it hard trying to pin this beast down by the reports of the creature I uh, had the creature by waterways, near to water, seashore, rivers, what have you, and couldn't have worked just as well the other direction is because it's that's where people are, so that's where people see these creatures, you know? Yes, that's that's certainly been you know, so it, it's, a consideration. It's, yes, it's not it's not so that this is where they habitat in these areas by running water and by oceans and that is just that that is people go to have the opportunity to have an encounter with these things so it's kind of to figure out to speculate i guess what their habitat is where they like to travel what routes they to use we are we're nowhere near being able to do those things nowhere near you know I mean, as i say it's nearly 50 years we've been trying to to find patterns and my approach to it now and for many years is that uh, they don't have patterns. And if they did, we would have found them long ago. Right. What about, okay, by the same token, um, this is a bit of a bone of contention with uh, a lot of people who follow Bigfoot and Sasquatch. In your opinion, is Sasquatch a Northwest event, as opposed to people who who believe well, that, that Sasquatch runs from Alaska to the Florida Panel? There have been sightings all over North America and the states. The sightings everywhere else are just as good as the sightings in the Northwest. So you you don't describe this as being a Northwest. No, this is just where people were first made aware of it. I lost in the forest a uh, Sasquatch uh, helping and her child. Uh, well, we do have a zoo report of gorilla doing exactly that. So yes, yes, this is, yeah. Uh, no one to dismiss these out of hand, but... Um, and that uh, concludes part one of my uh, conversation with John Green on that moment. And you can tell that the content is pretty well dated because uh, we even discuss his uh, database. And um, so those of you in the know realize that we're talking back some uh, 18, 20 years <laughs> on this one. Uh, you got to excuse the little clicks and clacks in it, but you had to remember this was transformed to an MP3 file from uh, a reel-to-reel -reel cassette recorder. And uh, those artifacts have shown up after many, many years of it lying on a shelf. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, the next podcast will be part two of the conversation with John Green. So once again, this is uh, Jerry Matthews wishing you all well, and uh, please get in touch if you wish. You can get a hold of me at yellowcoyote at talus.net. And I'd love to hear your comments on the show for good or ill. And until that time, please take care of yourselves. Okay, dear listener, that about wraps it up for now. My name is Jerry Matthews. You can reach me at yellowcoyote at talus.net. Thank you for your interest, and until the next time, keep searching. <laughs>